Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Michael Brenner, who is the CEO of Marketing Insider Group and co-author of the best-selling book, The Content Formula. Michael is also recognized by Forbes as Forbes' top CMO influencer and social media marketer, and Dun & Bad Bradstreet has also recognized him as a top B2B marketer. Michael has also been included on the list of the top 50 most influential content marketers in the country. And today, we are going to be talking about personalization and content marketing. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing, David? Doing excellent. Doing excellent. Um, I, I know we've kind of touched on this uh, offline before on personalization, so I've uh, been digging into it, and um, it's a um, very key thing as far as trying to break through the noise, I guess, even in That's even right. in content marketing. Um, you know, just yep. like any marketing, it gets noisy. But, you know, it's starting to get a little noisy in content marketing, so we got to kind of do our best to stay ahead of the game, and that's what we're here to do to help other people uh, accomplish. So, first off, uh, just first quickly explain what you mean by personalization and content marketing before we get into, you know, all the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, sure, and, and I think we, we also talked about this on a previous podcast around sort of the future trends in content marketing, and this was one mm -hmm. of the four. Um, yes. So I don't know if you, if you want me to recap those four very quickly, but uh, um, uh, yeah, basically, yeah, so the, the four, you know, trends that I think are really important, and these aren't, you know, like futuristic 2020. I mean, I think that, you know, right now, today, the, the companies that are really um, moving beyond or moving up the maturity curve, if you will, in content marketing, um, they're mm -hmm. starting to see and face a number of challenges, like you said, and breaking through the noise. And so um, the first trend I talked about was specialization, which is essentially brands um, trying to really truly define a space they can actually own. Um, uh, second is visualization, um, you know, essentially creating more visual kinds of content, which is a you know kind of a skill that not a lot of brands have really worked um, as hard on. Uh, the third was uh, humanization, which is kind of you know telling real human stories that that meet people. Uh, at their emotional level and, and, you know, touch upon the pains and challenges that they have. And, and then this final one is personalization. And, and again, all of this, I, I think all of these trends um, are, are important because of, like you said, the need for brands to move from just creating content to, to actually t taking that content marketing approach to deliver real business results. And, and personalization is so important because, uh, to get to your question, what it essentially means and, and kind of the easiest definition is delivering the right piece of content to the right person at the right time. Um, okay. So that's kind of the highest level definition, and then I think we can, we can dive in and get a little deeper on that. Okay, cool. So um, I, I guess to clarify, um, as far as personalization, you said right person, right time. Does it um, have to do with – you know, appropriate content, the appropriate person, which is which is what you're saying, or does it have to do with also creating content for different needs of like different stages of the buying cycle? Does that come into play as well when we're talking uh, with yeah. personalization? Yeah, I mean, there's you know, there's probably three or four, maybe even five, I think, best practice steps, if you will, to achieving mm -hmm. personalization. Um, one of those, and we can get into what I think the steps are, but but one of those is certainly uh, to begin with you have to have the content to deliver to the right person at the right time. So, yeah, I think that's a key component. Okay, cool. Now, you know, this could feel a little daunting because, I mean, it's just like, you know, they're out, you know, the, your potential clients and prospects out there are to know which stage they're in and to had, had it, try to hit them at the right time. It, it can seem very daunting, you know, in addition to trying to create personalized content for each and every person if, you know, you start to try to get into the weeds of it and, and try to take what you're reading or hearing today or reading elsewhere to, you know, you know verbatim. So can you provide some clarity on how this can be accomplished on a reasonable scale and maybe have a strategy, you know, you know, actually move the needle for you? Do you kind of get what I'm asking? I mean, it could feel like really hard yeah. to do this. Like how, how can we, yeah. how can one try to accomplish this? Where, where do you start on that? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think that there's, I, you know, I also often talk about how there's a couple of secrets in, in content marketing and, and, you know, probably the first secret that I talk about is that content marketing doesn't have to be that overwhelming or that difficult or that expensive. It's just really about answering the questions that your buyers have at each stage of the journey that they're facing. And, and they're knowable things. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, tools that I use to help my clients understand what those questions are 
you, know, you can use simple things like Google Trends and and you know even just Google Autofill to try to figure out you know what are people actually searching for when they go online and they start their their you know their journey towards trying to find a solution to a problem. So so content marketing overall doesn't have to be that hard. Um, the second secret is that the the return on investment to content marketing is evident for any brand that actually commits to finding it. And 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 in every case where I've worked with companies. You know, they're finding massive increases in return on investment with content marketing versus other or relative to other kinds of marketing approaches. So those are kind of my two secrets to try to help, you know, your audience uh, feel less overwhelmed by this thought of, okay, well, okay, if I've created content that maps the buyer journey and, and I'm, I'm, you know, showing results, well, now i got to think about personalization. Um, it's really just an extension of effective content marketing, which is know your audience, know what they're interested in, know what questions they ask at each stage of the buyer journey. Personalization really gets to how do you now deliver that in the most effective way. Okay. Now, I, I've read something about, you know, and you, you touched on it. It doesn't have to be super crazy expensive, um, but, it, you know, it, it sounds like it would be crazy expensive to try to, produce all this different content for each individual person and all that. I know that's not what we're saying, and that's why I'm trying to kind of dig into that to, to provide some clarity here or have you provide some clarity here. And, and so I, I read something about developing like modular content could be a solution. Are you familiar with that, and can you speak on that? Yeah, I mean, I think modular content is just, um, you know, essentially once you identify the things, the kinds of content your audience is interested in, you also need to think about the formats and the and the locations where they're most uh, apt to consume it. And so, by modularizing content, for example, you know you might you might answer a question like if uh, you know if you're a CRM software company, you might just simply start by answering the question, "What is what is CRM?" And mm -hmm. and you can modularize that into a simple infographic, into an image, into uh, into a blog post, into a video, uh, thirty second mm -hmm. explainer videos, or something. That I think uh, you know a lot of companies are are, are experimenting with. So um, yeah, I think you know basically it, it starts with the questions that your audience is asking. Um, it then proceeds into how do how do you as an organization turn your expertise into answers for those questions? And then the third step is really how do you make sure you've got that content in the right modular format so that you can then and, and some people call that atomization, but basically mm -hmm. then you can sort of uh, reassemble those atoms into the right you know, component compounds, if, if we're going to follow that analogy, um, for the right person at the right time. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and that, that's a way that kind of to touch on what you mentioned earlier, I mean, that, that's a way where you can save cost and you can provide some ideas on different pieces of content. So one piece could turn into 5, 10, 15 different pieces, and, and that's a way yeah. that you can go about, you know, you know, shortage of I, money or ideas, uh, and that, that yeah. can really help you out there. So, you know, yeah. speaking on the when, you know, when you should serve the right piece of content to the right person, how, how can this be accomplished? And I'd like for you to maybe talk about it for companies that have bigger data resources uh, and mm -hmm. for companies that really don't have that data or have a way of achieving that just because they're smaller or getting started and they don't have tons of traffic to, to get a lot of analytics from. Yeah, I mean, I think when we talk about personalization, um, you know, again, it starts with having a live, let's say, a, that library of modular assets. Again, so you've got, if you imagine your buyer's journey and you've created content for each stage and you've modularized it into different formats, so you have to have that as a baseline. Um, but then I think personalization really uh, lends itself to, um, from a when perspective, to all the time. And, and you know, I'll, give you, uh, I'll start with one example. You know, one of the easiest ways to implement personalization is just on your corporate website. And, and, you know, there's lots of different audiences that are going to land on your website and uh, few potential employees, existing employees, potential investors, existing investors, partners, and then obviously existing customers and prospects. And so, um, you know, companies in many ways where personalization started, started with um, first, I think, a segmented audience-based approach on their website from a, from a menu perspective, you know, for marketers, for investors, for employees. Um, now there's a, you know you can use simple kinds of technology to understand who's landing on your website and how can you serve up the right piece of content for them and so that would be the easiest way you know place to start and then you know obviously oh, wait, 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 let's, 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 let's touch that that's really interesting what you just said knowing who lands and serving the right piece of content so can you like explain that a little bit further because that's very interesting to hear so yeah I mean, I think, how, like what do you mean exactly and how can that be done 
Yeah. So, um, you know, account-based marketing is a big topic in B2B marketing right now. And, Mm -hmm. and all account-based marketing really is, 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 is creating a customized experience for a specific company Mm -hmm. and, and surrounding that company with all the content and expertise and assets that you have as an organization to try to get them to become a customer. And so, uh, account-based marketing, in a sense, is really just a an evolved um, uh, technic- technology solution to what many companies have been using for, for gosh, I think I used it at, at a startup, you know, 10 years ago, and it's reverse IP lookup. And so there are technology companies out there that use reverse IP lookup so that, you know, when I land on your website, um, you know, you will know that I'm coming from Marketing Insider Group and that I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and that the temperature here is 42 degrees. And so... Um, you don't need to have, a, you know, you don't need to be a large company to utilize those kinds of resources. Like I said, I was a, a, a 30-person company with no budget utilizing that technology 10 years ago. So it's, um, you know, I think it's pretty simple to implement so that you can actually know at least, at the very least, the the organization that someone is coming from, uh, potentially their location and, and, you know, and other aspects that, that you can then use to define, what you know, what kind of company is this and how can I serve up a, a custom experience for them. So what happens then? Like, so we, it, you're doing the IP reverse look out, uh, look up, and we recognize that you're a marketer or coming from a specific mm-hmm. company. Then, does your website respond differently? Does it show something different than if I were to go there, or my mom or dad or whatever? I mean, would it be yeah. would would the website look different? Show something different? Yeah, I mean, you know, with, with you, I mean, uh, Adobe Test and Target is is a great example of of a company that's offering this kind of service where. And in fact, if you go to Adobe.com, you're going to see a very different web experience than if your mom did. And and the reason for that now, obviously, they will they don't always know who you are and where you're coming from. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you're using you know if you're using an iPhone or if you're um, you know if you're using uh, I don't know I don't, do, do, do it, internet cafes even exist anymore I don't know. <laughs> but mm-hmm. uh, the point is that when they do know who you are, you're getting a very specific experience that's targeted to your potentially to your role, to your industry, to your location. Um, utilizing, uh, you know, essentially iframe technology. I mean, it's it test and target is essentially, uh, a, a, like you said, modularized. You can modularize your web page so that um, every component that's served up when somebody lands is completely customized. That, that's interesting. Now, does that uh, come with, like, you know, big-time developing coding need, you know, intelligence, or is, you know, can something like, a you know, a WordPress site give you the option to – I mean, obviously, WordPress sites can be, you know, have a heavy development in them, but is, is that needed, or are, are are there, you know, certain templates and, and stuff that you can utilize on the back end of a CMS without having crazy development knowledge to accomplish that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we used, uh, at, at SAP, we used Adobe Test and Target, so that was on a WordPress platform. Obviously, Adobe is an enterprise CMS solution, um, and so... Uh, utilizing WordPress and and, a, and, a, and an almost almost zero amount of of development resources. Essentially, we just had our developer create, like I said, a number of iframes. So that uh, and those iframes would, for example, if somebody landed on our website from a healthcare company, uh, the the featured you know piece of content, the kind of the hero image they might see, and linked to an art would be an article linked to a healthcare. Um, you know, piece of content. Just as a very simple example, that required almost no coding um, whatsoever. So, uh, so that's you know that's an enterprise solution. But again, there's I you know there's reverse IP lookup solutions for uh, you know for just any any size company and budget that that you can use to implement very rapid kinds of personalization and customization uh, for you know for your corporate website. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. Like, say you're B two C and you're not gonna you know it's not an account based thing. I guess a good place to start would be if, if it's a man or a woman, I guess, to serve them, you know, speak to them that way. Or um, is, I mean, is that a decent place to start on, on a lower level? Or, or what do you suggest if you're not going to, yeah. you know, you're not like account based and talking to a CFO yeah. or, a, you know, CMO, or, you know, you're talking to just to men or women, right? Yeah. I mean, do you yeah, agree with that? Depends. Or is that a good. Well, I mean, it, it just a really simple example, uh, another personalization, and this is more for e-commerce, is a company called Monetate, which is right up the road from me here in, in Philadelphia. Um, when you land on your website, at least you used to, I don't know if it's still this way, but they just very simply tell you what the weather is and your, where, where you live, where you're coming from. Um, hmm. So just simple things like that, just based, again, yeah. based on IP lookup. 
they can identify, okay, you're coming from a computer or a phone that's in this location. And one of the easiest things they could do to create a personalized experience is say, hey, it looks like it's, it's sunny in Philadelphia today. Um, you know, so very, very simple approaches like that can, can just create that, that experience for the user that it's a, that's personalized to them. Yeah, and, and it's not just the experience. You're, you're also already thinking, wow, this company's pretty sharp, right? So whatever else they yeah. must be selling must be pretty sharp as well, which is the whole idea behind content marketing, right, is to yep. become a thought leader and then by default or your products are better <laughs> just in the mm-hmm. eyes. So so that's that's, all, right. that, that, that's cool. So um, j- just to touch on again the smaller you this you know smaller business smaller budget what are what are some solutions you can point to that people can try to dig around and play with that won't break the bank uh, I know you mentioned the Adobe one for enterprise but are what are um, I guess just to, for starters they'll need to do the reverse IP can you point us to some good companies to, to look into there yeah, so um, I think, you know, and I don't even know if they're still around, but the company I used when I was at the startup, you know, 10 years ago was a company called Lead Pages. Um, and all they did was reverse IP lookup. So, you know, they would give you a report and say, here's who landed on your website based on their IP information, what companies they were with. Sometimes they actually know the individual username um, or, or email address if they had a cookie. But that, that's a very simple, very cost-effective solution. Um, the company, there are a couple of companies that I recommend, and I'm, I'm not getting paid to say this, but... There's companies that I have seen and experienced both as a, as a consultant and as a, almost as a customer. Um, and those companies are one spot, um, one spot, uh, really a thought leader in this whole personalization space. In fact, I'm, I'm partnering with them on some content initiatives. Again, making no money by referring them. Um, so there's no real skin in it for me, except I think they're really thought leaders in this space. And, and what they do is they, they call it content sequ- sequencing. And, and just explain what they do, for example, um, they go out and they, they sort of programmatically buy banner ad space. And then they work with a client to try to identify what's the right piece of content along the buyer journey for their clients. And so, for example, when, when Dave Reimer shows up on, let's say, Forbes, um, and you're reading an article about CRM, they might have an article on what is CRM, you know, just a very simple article presented in a banner ad. And then because they've cookied you, let's say you go and you land on the New York Times, they might serve up another ad that is uh, the ultimate guide to understanding CRM solutions. And then, um, you know, so sort of a deeper piece of content. And then, you know, in the fifth or sixth sequence, they might offer you up, you know, depending on where you are on the Internet, they might offer you up an actual ad to buy or to consider one spot or to consider the CRM solution they're selling or whatever. Um, all of that is done through uh, systematic, programmatic ad buying. Um, and, and they're showing 100x improvements in click-through rates with that kind of personalization. So, again, it requires a okay. user cookie. It, it requires having that content mapped across the buyer journey, but it's content sequencing, you know, follow, essentially following people around across the Internet but serving up different messages. Um, so that's one. And, and there's a company called IDIO, um, I-D-I-O. Uh, they're based in London. Um, actually, I was exposed to them when I was at SAP, and we, we didn't buy but considered um, utilizing them, very similar to what Up One Spot is doing, um, and, and getting deep, deeply involved into the whole account-based marketing and personalization space as well. Um, there's another company that I love called Sailthrough. Um, and so Sailthrough is a company that I found because I'm a subscriber to Business Insider's newsletter. And, and, and they've been using them for a couple of years. And what I found was that um, they, they essentially serve to me a different newsletter than they serve to everyone else based on my click-through patterns with the content that I consume on Business Insider's newsletter and website. And so the newsletter, I, I, I get a daily newsletter from them, and they serve up about 10 or 15 different articles, all of which are very specifically customized to me based on the things that I've clicked on before or shared before. Um, and they use they utilize sale-through for that technology. Um, so there's there's just a few. Um, so uh, OneSpot, uh, IDEO, and sale-through, those are, those are three. Uh, I think you know technologies that that just about any budget could handle. Okay. Now to um, circle back around to what you were saying earlier about the the banner ads and um, different serving different message or different piece of content uh, and the sequencing, and then uh, in re- and, and this is in regards to the buyer's journey and the stage of the you know different type of content, top of funnel, middle, towards the end. Is it? Basically, just assuming that you know they're 
they're, they're sequencing it. Like, uh, let's, you know, obviously uh, we've all read different, you know, done or more of a lot of us probably have looked into different stages of the buying cycle. There are like three stages or five stages or seven stages, but they're all saying the same things, but then, you know, you could slice them up. So you're going to be doing different pieces of content for that. Do they just sequence it just assuming, let's call it a five stages of the buying cycle, one, two, three, four, five, without you, without indicating on you doing this or that, they're just assuming, hey, let's just serve them in order. Is that is that the strategy there, or is it a lot more intricate in, in, than that? I, I, I mean, do you I, understand I, yeah, my question? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I'm not an expert in, in their technology. I just kind of generally know how it works. But, but um, you know, I've worked with companies like Vonage, who's a customer of theirs, and um, Intel is a, is a customer of theirs. And, and from, you know, from what I gather, they, they are modularizing their content into, into what's called buying stage buckets. But um, they're also using the click-through patterns and the engagement rates, even on the article you might be reading, to determine which banner ad to present. So, for example, let's say you're, you're reading that article on, um, where did I say, Forbes, uh, and they present a what is CRM um, article content ad, right, in the banner, in the digital display banner. Um, if you don't click on that, they might serve you a different, you know, sort of uh, version of, of that same kind of piece of content with a different piece of creative. Or they might serve a different article that they've also mapped to the early stage if you didn't click on it. So so they're mm-hmm. constantly testing both not just content, stage, uh, image, headline. Um, they're testing all of those element, elements and then and then trying to essentially optimize into – Though you know, let's call it the you know the sort of the uh, the optimized ideal kind of mechanism to to get you to engage with that with that um, interactive ad unit. Gotcha. So it'd be like if you're a stage one of the buying cycle, you don't click another stage one, another stage one, another stage one, and then if they, you happen to finally click on one of those or read one of those or spend some time on one of those, then the next stage of the buying cycle type of content until you read and then the next and the next. Yeah, that makes a lot exactly. of sense. Okay, awesome. Now, um, and again, you know, that, I mean, it makes sense. I get it. it it's still, I, I do know kind of what goes into some of this stuff, and it's 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 more than than just, you know, jumping in right away and accomplishing it, but it is something that a lot of people can can move forward with by just being given the idea that you're doing today, and, and we all appreciate mm-hmm. that. But if you wanted to do something, would this count and would this uh, be a way for people to implement right away? Would be like a Facebook campaign where you can design a series of pieces of content to get delivered to the same person um, and then sequence those as – the same kind of thing, you know, instead of banner ads, we go through Facebook. Are you familiar with that at all? And would this be something that, you know, people, you know, smaller businesses can jump into right away? I mean, everybody can place Facebook ads, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Obviously, knowing how to do this is a little bit next step, but you can figure it out or you can call a marketing company and they can help you out with it. But uh, would that be something that people can dip in? Would, would, Would you suggest like, yeah, it's a great starting point or is, are we off base on that? No, I, th- I mean, Facebook, you know, and again, as, as a content marketer, my uh, bias is always towards um, starting with your owned platforms before investing in, um, let's say, off-domain or, or unowned platforms like publisher sites. But, I mean, Facebook as a platform itself offers personalization. So, you know, the, the, the things that you see in your newsfeed are totally personalized based on the things you've engaged with and the things that your friend circle has engaged with as well. So there's already personalization and trending topics and newsfeed algorithms that are already in place for for Facebook. As an advertiser, they offer uh, um, they do offer personalization for their advertiser um, audience. And so, you know, for example, they leverage um, I, you know data brokers. I want to say like Experian and Data Logics, those kind of companies, um, to give advertisers um, options beyond just the targeting and filtering that you can select with a Facebook ad. Um, and so you can get much more granular around building a profile from Facebook users. Now, whether they offer content sequencing in the way that, like, OneSpot does, I don't know. Um, but I do know that they do offer that, that sort of uh, user profile service where not only will you know, again, the things, the demographics that you've identified in your, in your Facebook feed or your Facebook account, but then they also map that use, using data providers um, to build out a you know a, a larger user profile. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I, I will say we, we we do build out Facebook campaigns that are sequenced like that. Um, the unofficial word, I guess, John Loomer, who you might be familiar with, big Facebook mm-hmm. marketing guru that um, yeah. we learn from constantly. He calls them evergreen. I think he, he came up with that term evergreen campaign. So if anyone out there wants to Google John Loomer evergreen campaigns, that he talks about sequencing, you know, putting all these in order. You're going to get this one and then this one and that one. But that's the tool and the methodology. Then you need to have Mm -hmm. strategy and learn from people like Michael here um, to think it through. Okay, now what are we going to say? What are we going to serve? You know, let's think this through. Let's put these in order. So the tools are out there. The methodology is out there to learn from how to do it. And then strategy learning from people like Michael is obviously um, super important. Now, what what are some of the most common mistakes people made um, in personalization and, and any advice on how to avoid them? Well, I mean, it's I you know I think there's a number of steps, and we didn't you know we didn't really get into steps. So I don't know if, if you want, I could walk kind of walk through I yeah, think the, the four main steps to to personalization, and and you know I, I think not doing one of the steps is essentially the biggest mistakes, and and it really okay. starts with I think um, building out user profiles, and and um, I want to make sure I'm very clear that I'm not talking about personas, and the reason that I think um, uh, I want to make that clear is that personas you know can help as a baseline. But where personas often fall short is identifying the user interests, uh, the things that people are interested in that don't necessarily relate to your product. And so, it's, you know, Google calls it an intent-based approach, right? Understand what your audience is interested in. That's the best way to find your audience. Knowing, you know, the demographics, so, you know, that you're, you're targeting a 25 to 35-year-old, you know, white female um, isn't going to help much in the content creation and personalization process if you don't know what those people are actually consuming and reading and interested in online. So so it starts with, I think, building out user profiles that truly understand not just the demographics, but also the interests that they ha- that, that, that your target audience has. So that's, that's sort of stage one, user profiles. And often what that looks like, it looks less like an individual target segmentation and much more like a group segmentation. So for example, um, you know, some people call these interest profiles. So, you know, people that love cats, right? So that, that's an interest profile, and, and, and it's not a demographic, right? So those are some of the segments that I think people um, that do personalization well are, build out those interest-based segmentation uh, approaches. Now, the segments could also be based on location or role, or, you know, company size, industry, all of those kinds of things, typical demographic stuff. But getting – informing the content plan – um, requires understanding those interest segments. So that's that's number one. Number two is then having the content. Um, the biggest mistake I see with companies in content marketing is they have too much late stage content and not enough early stage content. And you can even you can even use very simple tools like Google Autofill <laughs> to understand or Google Trends to simply understand the the volume of of your target audience interests in early stage versus late stage kinds of, of, of content. So so you have to have content, you have to have it mapped across the buyer journey. And the biggest mistake companies make is not having enough early and middle stage content that really kind of uh, almost, you know, in, intentionally avoids the product conversation um, for a little bit longer than most companies are comfortable with. So that's number two. And, and, and let me chime in on something that you've said in the past that has helped provide clarity for me. Um, mm mm-hmm. You mentioned, you know, you're using, um, you're being great advice, but you know, vague in the sense that, you know, more here, more there. The, the example, what you what you said is, for every one piece of the final stage of content, you want 10 pieces of middle content. You want 100 pieces of early stage content. The early stage content is, uh, you know, answering questions, you know. Uh, speaking to pain points and needs and being helpful and all of that. Um, in the late stage content would be more of like a case study, you know, product, you know, yep. uh, mm-hmm. uh, like more of a sales, more about yourself. So what yeah. Michael has seen and I've learned from him um, is that a lot of people do focus because it's more comfortable to them on the end of that, you know, about us, mm-hmm. our company, how great we are, how great our products are, how we compare to others, our cost benefits, blah, 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 all that stuff. And I say blah, blah, blah. It's important. But people aren't going to get there, at least not many as people are going to get there. And so that's where people front, you know, or backload their content, I guess. And what Michael is yeah. saying and has been preaching forever is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You need to go – 
uh, heavy on the on the top of the funnel on the the beginning the awareness stuff. So you know the formula he gives is a uh, you know to put it in a one to ten to a hundred. So every one piece mm-hmm. of content you're writing about your products and services, you need a hundred of the other stuff. So and you That's know right. obviously it could be one you know, to 50 or whatever, but the point Michael makes is heavy, heavy, heavy up front. So anyway, so sorry, right. sorry to interrupt, but I no. wanted to clarify that. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I, I tried to name it the Brenner principle, but it didn't really stick. Um, no, why not? But yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, good. it's you know, kind of like the Pareto principle of, of, you know, the 80-20 rule. And, and it's, you know, you're right. Most companies have a, have a pyramid, you know, where most of their content is in the late stage and very little of their content is in the early stage, but it should be inverted. It should be, like you said, for every one piece of product content, which I'm not saying, like you said, it's important. I'm not saying to stop creating that. What I'm saying is that the balance is, the mix is off and off. And and too too many companies don't have, just simply don't have enough early stage content to map to the number of people and the number of questions that buyers are asking early in the process. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're right, 100, 100 pieces of content for every one piece of product content and then, you know, something like 10. And, and, again, these numbers are just guides. You can use sure. free tools online to figure out exactly what that number is for, for you. And at SAP, we found in the big data category, the number was 30,000. There were 30,000 times more people searching for early stage, you know, what is big data and what does it really mean kinds of content than there were for every one person looking for, you know, actually purchasing a big data solution. So, you know, it really depends on the category that you're in, but um, – but I think one to 100 is a great place to start. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So, yeah, so that's number two. The, the third thing, and this is, you know, this is kind of classic marketing, but um, what I think a lot of companies forget, and actually my co-author for the content formula just published an article on my site today about the importance of tone, the importance of tone in personalization. And what I mean by that is it's not necessarily a unique point of view or why we're different or why we're the leading company and blah, blah, blah. It's more about what separates you from – um, everyone else that people might be getting content from, and she used the skim as a great example of, you know, if you look at headlines on the skim newsletter versus on the same topic versus the New York Times, you you can you immediately know that this is a headline from the skim. And uh-huh. so creating content that has a unique sort of sense of tone um, and approach, and this is kind of part of that specialization and humanization um, trend that I talked about to begin with, but but really understanding tone and copywriting and all that kind of stuff is important. Um, so that's the third step, right? Do you have a tone that differentiates you from, you know, just everybody else in the marketplace? And then the fourth is delivery, and that's where we kind of got into the technology and where. You know, what technology do you use and where do you then apply personalization? The answer really is you should apply it everywhere. You should do it on your website. You should do it on Facebook. You should do it um, in your newsletters, and, and, you know, technology can support all of that. Uh, but, again, we're talking about personalization as a trend in content marketing because, uh, simply because the companies that are utilizing it are seeing much higher engagement and conversion rates than companies that don't. Well, it makes sense. I mean, it makes sense. You know, obvi- I mean, the more personal, more human you can be, the more people will be drawn and, and attracted to you. I mean, marketing 101, right? Putting the right message in front of the right person, right? And it yep, just, you right. know, as the world grows and as the Internet grows, it can get yep. harder. But at the same time, technology develops alongside of it and makes it easier. So uh, that's why yep. we're talking and learning from people like Michael so that we can stay ahead of it and, and, and always be ahead of our competition. Well, um, awesome. Do you have any parting thoughts or any other examples you'd like to share before we have to let you go here? Well, I mean, you know, people are looking. At, I think examples are always a great way to uh, highlight the importance and the and the and the uh, process that companies need to go through to think about personalization. So I'll just mm-hmm. I'll just read off a list of a couple of my favorite examples if we have time. Oh, absolutely. I, I wanted you to give as many examples. You already gave a few, so I wasn't going to circle back yeah. around to that. But yeah, yeah, it just yeah. as many examples as you can provide. That always helps me. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the 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 number one or two examples that most people think of when they think of personalization is Amazon, right? So when when I go to Amazon, they serve up a list of products that I might be interested in based on my user history, based on my uh, viewing history, based on my purchase history. So Amazon recommendations, perfect example of a company building a profile around my purchase history and my viewing history and presenting recommendations to me. Great example of personalization. Um, another popular example is Netflix. When I go to Netflix, it says, oh, you, you've recently watched this. Do you want to continue watching? You might also like these titles because they're similar to stuff you've already watched. So, you know, again, very simple consumer kind of examples that people can, I think, relate to. Uh, one of my favorite examples is Spotify. 
Um, and I, I'm actually not a Spotify user, but I've just I've seen I've come across this example where um, it might say, oh, you know, you are the number one um, engaged uh, fan of the Foo Fighters, and 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 so they'll send an email that says, here's you know, here's an email from Dave Grohl. Uh, and, and Dave will say, hey, Mike, you know, I really appreciate that you've been a great, you know, fan of our music. And, you know, this month you're one of our top engaged fans. You downloaded seven of our songs and, you know, you, you listen to them in your Uber taxi ride. And, 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 you know, just a truly personalized message based on their, you know, account history of knowing what Spotify users are doing by delivering an actual message from the artist, which, you know, I don't know if they actually get the artist to write those messages, but I think it's a pretty cool approach to, uh, to personalization. Um, we talked about Business Insider, you know, LinkedIn jobs. When, when you go to LinkedIn, it says, hey, you, you might be interested in these jobs because they're in your area or in, in your profession. Um, you know, just another great example there. So, so again, you know, Twitter, Twitter does it with, you know, you might want to follow people based on people you already follow. Facebook you know, obviously does it. So, you know, again, there's a lot of great examples out there in the consumer space. Um, I think I've already mentioned Intel, Vonage, uh, Monetate as great examples on the B2B space. So, you know, hopefully that's enough examples to get people, you know, interested to go check them out and see what they're, they're working on. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of just paints the picture. I mean, it's, you know, impossible to speak to a million companies, you know, all, all. But in general, though, you just give a general, like, in general, this is what people are doing. How can that apply yep. for you? And um, right. the, Michael mentioned a ton of technologies out there that, that can help do this and then, it comes down to being creative and, and, and you okay. know, obviously setting up your structure, get your content, get your audit, you know, or get your plan for what you will be writing about. Go heavy up front and then follow people through and deliver um, a, a personalized experience as you can, and there's various ways to go about it. So that's yeah. awesome, man. That's awesome. I'm going to um, make a note to re-listen to this <laughs> with my team because I want to uh, also get further, you know, get better about all this because it is – I've been really looking forward to this podcast because I really wanted to dig in with this. So uh, I think you've provided a lot of clarity and a lot of examples and greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, Michael, how can people continue to learn from you, buddy? Yeah, sure. Um, MarketingInsiderGroup.com. I share daily uh, insights from not just myself but other folks in our industry, uh, essentially covering um, focus on content marketing but also you know, covering digital marketing in general, trends in our space and you know, marketing automation and, um, you know, social platforms and, and demand generation and, and, you know, B2B marketing. So, uh, you know, would love for your, your, your audience to come check it out there. Uh, you also also find me on Twitter at Brenner Michael. Um, I, I try to share not just my own insights, but insights from many others, uh, to really help, you know, advance our profession. I think the marketing profession currently is, is under attack from, you know, from the forces of digital transformation and this sort of, Promotional, promotion-centric, um, you know, traditional marketers. I think that that are you know starting to feel the pressure of showing results and delivering content that people actually want. And and so the, that's the kind of insights and expertise I try to share for myself and others. And would love to engage with your audience on those platforms. Well, you don't try, Michael. You do. Um, <laughs> and for the listeners out there, uh, his spelling of his Twitter handle is at Brenner Michael. That's B R E N N E R. M I C H A E L. All right, Michael. Hey, appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to the next one. Thanks so much. All right. Bye bye. Take care. All right. Cool, man. That was awesome. Yeah, I truly am yeah. going to go back and listen to this. Lots lot to, lot, lot to soak in. Uh, I've yeah. talked to some of those companies. I need to revisit them um, as we start.